This one's gonna be fun. Today, it's an epic track from a throwaway album. Or at least that's what the band called it. This song, though, it set a new standard for how rock bands wrote and released singles in the 80s. And in the process, it became one of their signature hits. Unfortunately, it never got its due on the charts. In fact, because their label hated it and they refused to promote it. This incredible track, it just tanked. So to keep uh, the song alive, the band actually funded a music video out of their own pockets. They pay for it themselves. People went crazy for it. It actually set MTV records. It was so popular, the network pulled the plug on it to give other videos screen time. They actually made up a rule. How does that make any sense? This is the story you're not gonna wanna miss coming up on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you've ever gotten frustrated when the slinky wouldn't slink down the stairs, you know, like it did in the commercial, or if you ever pulled the stickers off of the Rubik's Cube to get all the colors lined up because you couldn't figure it out, you're gonna dig this channel of musical nostalgia. What walks downstairs, a loner in pairs, and makes a slinkity sound. Was I the only one that did these things? <laughs> Make sure that you subscribe below right now and click the notification bell. That actually helps this channel the most by having you sub to it, gets out to more people. Also, if you appreciate our programming, you wanna help support classic music of our youth, consider uh, going out on Patreon. We give you more content there. You can become an honorary producer and that truly helps us. So you know what? It's time for one of my favorite shows we do on here. Number one in our hearts. This is a show that honors songs that were so unbelievably great. They absolutely should have been number one on the Billboard Hot 100 chart. Seriously, this program exists to level the playing field. Since a lot of the songs that I rewrite history on, that I honor, they were actually had more streams and plays than the songs that were number one that week in the decade since. I mean, sometimes Paola helped a lot of these songs back then. Now, previous episodes, we've covered Hysteria by Def Leppard, What It Takes by Aerosmith, and Mom, I'm Coming Home by Ozzy Osbourne. Today, we're going to kind of go in that vein. One of the best songs from a hard rock band that should have been a no doubt about it number one hit. I'm talking about Home Sweet Home by Motley Crue. Hey, home sweet home. After the multi-platinum success of Motley Crue's 1983 sophomore LP, Shout at the Devil, the band went through a couple of turbulent years. Kind of like the turbulent time they're going through right now. Crue's hedonistic extracurricular activities have been well documented. We've already covered some of that on this channel. Uh, so I'm gonna forego the details here. It's kind of a family channel here. Let's just say these guys were the poster boys for sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Kicked into overdrive, I must add. And by the recording of their third studio album, Theater of Pain, it was starting to catch up with them, uh, big time. Motley Crue had earned a legitimate reputation for being a reckless and dangerous band, which makes for an interesting contrast to the song that we're about to cover. The recording process for Theater of Pain, that began in January of 85 and it extended into the following May. Uh, the album marked a turning point in the evolution of the band's style, showcasing more of a commercial glam metal feel. Gone were the days of the traditional heavy metal sound of Too Fast for Love and Shout at the Devil. Which actually made Theater of Pain one of Motley Crue's least favorite records by uh, any fan's account. Um, in fact, they considered most of its songs throwaway tracks, the band did. Said frontman Vince Neil about it, outside of Home Sweet Home, the rest of the album was pure shit. Um, every night when I ran around on stage in my pink leather pants that laced up the sides, I felt like the only one sober enough to realize how bad some of these songs actually were. I was shocked the record went double platinum, actually. And maybe it's just, uh, you know, reinforce the idea that we were so great, we could even get away with putting out a terrible album. Pretty harsh words there from Vince, but regardless of Vince Neil's assessment, Theater of Pain reached number six on the Billboard 200 Albums chart. And you know, internationally, it went to number 36 in the UK, it went to number 25 in Switzerland, number nine in Canada, seven in Sweden, and number five in Finland. 
And actually, the RIAA also certified it quadruple platinum in 1995, so it sold 4 million copies, even better. Singles included a reworked version of Brownsville Station's uh, Smoking in the Boys' Room and today's featured song, Home Sweet Home. So Home Sweet Home, that was a response to Motley Crue touring in 1983 to support Shout at the Devil. This was actually the first time on the road for the band. It was uh, quite a whirlwind experience for them. Uh, but when they got back, they didn't really know what to do with themselves. Uh, bassist Nikki Six would say, a tour bus picked us up at our little tiny apartments and we took off to go play some shows. 18 months later, we got dropped back at these little apartments. I remember I called Tommy and I was like, hey, what are you doing? And he's like, sitting here. What are you doing? I don't know what to do. Well, I don't know what to do either. That's kind of how the conversation went. So they just started writing their next album from there. That's when Home Sweet Home really came out. It just fell out. The lyrics really came from that feeling of being gone so long and wanting to come back home, which the guys called ironic because all you ever want to do when you get in the band is go out on the road. But then when you're out on the road, all you want to do is come home. Vince Neil remembered writing this song while he was sitting in the recording studio. You know, during this time, drummer Tommy Lee, he came up with the piano chords. And then almost immediately, Vince started humming along. From there, the song you know, started to take shape as it were, a song that we hear today. Nikki Six elaborated on Neil's memory, saying that he had been messing around with the song's riff since he was about 17. He'd never really been able to flesh it out. Then one night, as they were leaving rehearsal, Tommy started mimicking the riff on the piano. And, uh, you know, he added some of his own panache to it. Then everything, it just fell into place. Reportedly, they wrote the song in like 10 or 15 minutes. That's how the great ones come out a lot of the time. Home Sweet Home was one of the first songs they put to tape for theater pain. You know that I've seen too many but it was recorded so poorly that it took some time to finish. You know, the band would come into the studio and go through two takes, hate them both, get bored, and then they go home. They repeated this process every day for a week before finally getting the song down. It also didn't help that the band was getting a lot of pushback from their label, Elektra. The two parties were always at odds, it seemed. Back in 83, Elektra had outright rejected their album, Shout at the Devil. They said it didn't sound like their previous album, 1981's Too Fast for Love. So the guys told them they'd start looking for a new label. So then Electra caved and released Shout at the Devil. Nikki Six said, it sold four million copies. Electra was about to go bankrupt at that time. And you know what? We saved their ass. Now, as we continue to break down, celebrate this song, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eye, where the glasses I always wear. It's really simple. You just click on the info button right up here, get the best price on prescription glasses, up to 80% off regular retail prices. Uh, you choose your own design, the price is so good, you can get like two or three pair for what you'd pay for one with other brands. Try it today. Click on this. So when it came time to put together Theater of Pain, it was the same thing all over again, especially when it came to Home Sweet Home. Electra said, this is horrible. You have to take that song off the record. You guys aren't a ballad band. But there's a first time for everything as we know, and the band, especially Nikki Six, was adamant about keeping the song. They'd written the song, and it was going on the album. That was that. Uh, said Six about it. Came out with Smoking in the Boys' Room, and that blew up. And then we wanted to release Home Sweet Home, and the record company said, no way, no way. So we funded it. We shot the video ourselves, went on MTV, and as the rest is history. So without any support from the label, Home Sweet Home entered the Hot 100 on October 26th, 1985. A few weeks later, it peaked at number 89, and then it quickly fell off the charts. Now on the mainstream rock chart, it barely broke the top 40, it reached number 39. In the UK, 
Didn't fare very well either. Peaked at number 51. Such a waste. This epic song achieved so far below its potential because Elektra refused to have anything to do with it. They never worked it at radio at all. They never promoted it. If it wasn't for MTV, Home Sweet Home would be an all but unknown song today. I mean, you'd think that the label would have learned their lesson from the previous record when they wouldn't release Shout at the Devil and then it sold four million copies. So taking matters into their own hands, Motley Crue paid for the music video out of their own pockets and they submitted it to MTV. And that's the only reason it did as well as it did. The video, it was a smash. It was a hit on MTV. Fans flooded the request lines for over three months asking for this video. Finally, with no end in sight, MTV invoked the unwritten crew rule, meaning that from then on, music videos came with an expiration date. 30 days after their MTV premiere, videos would be dropped from the request line. Incidentally, Home Sweet Home was the most requested video in early MTV history. Uh, specifically from 81 to 85. And on the strength of the video alone, Motley Crue broke into the mainstream and they established Home Sweet Home as one of their signature songs. And a song that was so popular, <laughs> it forced MTV to write up a stupid rule. And that went for every superstar and band that came after that. Keeps me together. In this process, Motley Crue inadvertently introduced the concept of the commercial power ballad. I mean, before Home Sweet Home, power ballads didn't really factor into most bands' single release strategy. But after Home Sweet Home, it seemed like every rock band had a ballad ready for release as their you know, second or third single, just to try and expand their audience. Ben Leader, editor of Circus Magazine, summed it up perfectly saying, everybody had to have their big power pop power ballad, right? You gotta drop your two heavy tracks first so you don't lose credibility. Then the power ballad comes six months down the marketing cycle because that's what's gonna sustain the sales and break a band even bigger. You know, get all the girls who aren't involved and help sell out shows. But because the band came out rocking, you know, the guys, they're just not turned off about it. It would be a formula that would be critical to commercial success of just about every 80s hard rock act after Motley Crue established it. True, Home Sweet Home wasn't the first power ballad ever written. I mean, bands like Styx and Journey, The Scorpions and Night Ranger had already tested out this dynamic before. But it was Motley Crue who really upped the ante, you know? captured the wide-eyed attention of the MTV generation, as it were. Tonight, tonight, all, all In 1988, Poison released Every Rose Has Its Thorn. Now, that was the third single on the album after Rocker's Nothing But A Good Time and Fallen Angel came out. Every rose has its thorn. 1989, Skid Row released Youth Gone Wild and 18 in Life, Before I Remember You. White Snake, they released Is This Love after Still the Night and Here I Go Again in 87. Oh, is this love? And Def Leppard, of course, released Hysteria. That was the fourth single from Hysteria, following rockers Animal, Women, and Pour Some Sugar on Me. Of course, later they doubled down with Love Bites. <laughs> Even Guns N' Roses played the game. I mean, you know, really sweet child of mine. They did that after It's So Easy, Mr. Brownstone in the UK, and Welcome to the Jungle uh, here in the US. Although Pegan's Sweet Child of Mine is a straight up power ballad, that's stretching it a bit, but you get the point here. So what were the results? All of these power ballads were monster commercial hits. Hysteria went to number 10. I Remember You went to number 6. Is This Love went to number 2. And Every Rose Has Its Thorn, Love Bites, and Sweet Child of Mine, they all went to number 1. In terms of album sales, I mean, Skid Row's debut went to number 6 in the U.S. It sold 6 million copies worldwide. 
Poisons open up and say, ah, that reached number two, selling 8 million units. White Snake's 1987 self-titled album, that also reached number two and it sold 9 million. And of course, Def Leppard's Hysteria and GNR's Appetite for Destruction, both, they went to number one. They sold in excess of 25 and 30 million records, respectively. Huge. You can't deny it. It was a winning formula. And Motley Crue, they kicked it all off. Though they didn't invent the power ballad. We'll have to cover that in a future episode. Another story there. But maybe an example of what not to do will help drive the point home. In 1985, Twisted Sister released a lead-off ballad from their album Come Out and Play. Uh, this song was a bubblegum pop metal cover of the Shangri-Las, number one hit leader of the pack. Uh, according to their guitarist, J.J. French, releasing leader of the pack as a lead-off single was the biggest mistake of the band's career. It actually led directly to the band's demise. Leader of the pack, it flopped right out of the gate on rock radio, but what's worse, it alienated Twisted Sister's core fan base. They did release some harder rocking singles trying to correct course after, but it was too late. The damage was done. This premature ballad had cost them greatly and come out and play ended up hitless. That's what you fell for. The, the lesson learned here is save your power ballad for the second or third single at least. The lessons we learned in the 80s. So then, in October of 1991, Motley Crue released their first greatest hits album, Decade of Decadence, 81 to 91. The 15 track album peaked at number two on the US Billboard 200 chart, and it featured a remix version of Home Sweet Home called Home Sweet Home 91. Uh, the remix would be the band's final US top 40 hit. It reached number 37 on the Hot 100 in uh, 92. Still, an impressive feat as grunge was just starting to come on. Now, for the re-release, the band also made a new video, this time a black and white clip directed by Matt Mahern. Since then, Home Sweet Home has appeared in several movies and TV shows, including One Tree Hill, uh, The Goldbergs, Californication. Billions, Hightown, Peacemaker. It's a bitch song, but it still rocks. And actually was just used to great effect in Stranger Things. Actually, a parody of the Home Sweet Home video was used for the end credits of Hot Tub Time Machine with Lou Violator Dorchin decked out in uh, Vince Neil's purple vest, white tiger stripe spandex, and his headband. The band's name was altered to Motley Lou. <laughs> Home Sweet Home also has had a lot of covers. It's been covered by Daughtry, John Mayer, Nickelback, Slaughter. Limp Bizkit and Motley Crue teamed up with Chester Bennington to do it as well. Actually, in 2009, Carrie Underwood recorded a country version of the song for American Idol. Her rendition actually charted higher than the original reached number 21 on the Billboard Hot 100. And despite its overall lackluster performance on the charts though, Home Sweet Home still became a signature song for the crew. And it remains one of the most popular tracks in concert. I mean, have the label promoted it effectively, I know it would have been at least a top 10 hit. With its popularity on MTV, it might have pulled off the first number one hit by a hard rock band in the glam metal era. Who knows? So the week the Home Sweet Home peaked at number 89 on the Billboard Hot 100, the top three songs were Head Over Heels by Tears for Fears at number three. There was Part Time Lover by Stevie Wonder at number two, and the Miami Vice theme by Jan Hammer at number one. Now, normally on these episodes, I like to rewrite history and give one week from the chart topper to our featured song. But you know, and in this case, Jan Hammer's Miami Vice theme only had one week at number one, and that's a perfectly 80s song. I'm gonna call an audible here. 
And fast forward to January 18th, 1992, when Home Sweet Home was even higher, peaking at number 37 in 91. That week, the top three songs on the Hot 100 were Mariah Carey's Can't Let Go at number three, Color Me Bad's All For Love at number two, and Michael Jackson's Black or White at number one. Now, there's no doubt that MJ's Black or White was a massive cultural event at that time. The song went to number one pretty much everywhere. And in the U.S., it stayed at number one uh, for seven weeks. That's exactly why I called this Audible, though. Look, Home Sweet Home is a bona fide number one caliber hit. And since it missed out so badly, I think MJ's Black or White could step aside for one week to give Motley Crue its deserved spot at the very top. We all know that Home Sweet Home deserves it. This song was about the only track from Theater of Pain that I dared play out loud on my stereo from my Theater of Pain cassette. You know, I was in fear that my mom might take it away based on the fallacy that all hard rock and metal bands were devil music. It was actually the first Motley Crue album I bought, and it brings back some great memories of a phenomenal year, 85 into 86. Now I look at the current drama with Motley Crue between the band and uh, Mick Mars, and it just makes me sad. Why is there so much drama with my favorite bands these days? I don't know, but one thing I do know, it all comes back to the music. That's what we're gonna remember in the end. And Home Sweet Home, that was the Motley Crue at their best. I gotta choose to hold on to that. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about Motley Crue and Home Sweet Home. What did you think about the way it was used recently on Stranger Things? What do you think about the current state of Motley Crue? Most importantly, what are your memories of this song? Let us know in the comments below. If you dig this content, love to have you subscribe. Love to have you a part of our community here. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends.